important with respect to there's a prevention of uh, this malnutrition. We all know that aquaculture being the fastest growing sector in terms of uh, food industry among all these different type of food industry, aquaculture sector is the uh, fastest growing one. And there are some problems related to uh, this particular sector as well. But uh, in order to mitigate the problem of malnutrition and mitigate the problem related to hunger uh, throughout the world, uh, we actually aquaculture is uh, playing a very important role. Uh, because uh, as we all know, uh, that the total land mass throughout the world is gradually decreasing uh, with the advancement of all these uh, with increased population, and we can see here there is going to be a huge increase in the worldwide global population uh, by the years. And uh, the land utility, the land mass available for utilization of agriculture uh, is uh, gradually decreasing day by day. And as we are producing less amount of, of uh, food or agricultural products, the land mass for production of agriculture is decreasing. Uh, the chance that people would be receiving less amount of food is uh, being increased. So in that aspect, aquaculture, with a vast uh, resource of water, to be more precise, the marine water resources, it is uh, playing a very important uh, role. Uh, but there is a darker side of this as well, as we are uh, actually exploiting our natural resource uh, to a great extent, and almost have reached the limit of captured fisheries because 75% of the major fishing sites are actually being overfished. And in order to meet with all the requirements, uh, in order to prevent, in order to uh, mitigate the problem of malnutrition, where fish is a very important source of nutrition, as we all know, uh, we have almost reached the uh, full capacity of exploiting the available natural resource. So in this uh, aspect, the concept of capture fishery has actually become very important. As we can see in this particular graph uh, being taken from FAO, uh, you can see that the capture fisheries from the inland water since 1950 has not increased that much. Uh, the marine fisheries, uh, the marine uh, capture fishery has definitely increased over the years, but uh, since uh, around 1990s or so, it has almost reached the plateau. The saturation point has been reached with respect to the capture fisheries from even the marine resources. While the cultural fisheries, both in terms of inland culture as well as uh, from the uh, marine culture, that is increasing over the years. So what we are trying to do is, we are trying to utilize the available water resource uh, and we are using that resource for culturing fish rather than capturing or exploiting the natural resources. But in order to do so, in order to produce a whole amount of fishery products uh, in water, uh, we are uh, reaching, we are going towards much more intensification. And nowadays, we are uh, doing a typical sort of intensified aquaculture system, where within a small space, we are uh, culturing a whole lot of, uh, a huge stocking intensity has been conducted, and a whole lot of issues have been cultured in a small space. But uh, this intensification of culture has its own uh, problem uh, because with intensified culture, we are also causing a whole lot of habitat destruction. Uh, the water where the fishes are being cultured, they, we are using a whole lot of uh, additional food stuffs, the supplemented food containing a high amount of uh, nutritional material, and all these nutritions are spoiling the water, the fish meal. We all know that the major protein source of the uh, aquaculture feed industry is coming from fish meal, but that is also polluting the water, that is degrading the water quality. And with high stocking density and addition of a great amount of supplementing food uh, in the aquatic system, the quality of the water in the aquatic system, they get lost. Or they are gradually being degraded. And often we use in order to prevent uh, the diseases because high stocking density often is being associated with uh, occurrence of a high amount of disease development as well. And in order to prevent the disease in the culture system, we use uh, indiscriminately a whole lot of antibiotics. And along with this antibiotic uh, administration, there is always a chance 
that a pool of antibiotic resistant bacteria would be developed. Often uh, there are uh, utilization of a uh, different type of chemotherapy things as well, and that can get accumulated in the water body uh, because of nutrient heavy nutrient deposition in the system. Uh, the quality of water is uh, being lost, and along with intensification, we often prefer to go for culture of a few number of species. We have our own preferences: what type of food, what type of fish we are consuming, and accordingly we are using. or we are concentrating on culture of specific type of fish ultimately which can lead to loss of uh, natural biodiversity so often it has been happened that with intensification of one or two more coveted species and its culture uh, the diversity of a pond system or an aquatic system is being uh, lost altogether so all these problems are actually being there now we have to think of a balance we need to create a balance Uh, between our need and uh, how much exploitation can actually be done to the nature so this huge there is definitely a huge challenge of uh, meeting the need of providing nutrition providing food uh, to all the population of the world throughout the world uh, world but also we must think about safeguarding the resources the natural resources must also be protected uh, meeting it uh, the requirement of the human being so in order to develop that the concept of green technology in aquaculture has also been is being now uh, raised so what is actually green technology by uh, green technology we often want to concentrate on uh, something which is basically a sort of sustainable utilization of the resources we want to develop technology to actually mitigate uh, all these ill effects of intensive culture all these ill effects of development technological development so it's basically utilization or invention of certain technologies mitigating the ill effects of uh, different human activities we are spoiling the nature and we want to again develop technologies to prevent that sort of spoiling or to reverse back what we have done what bad things have been done by us to the nature that's the basic concept of uh, green technology so we are trying to develop and apply different type of products different type of equipments which can be used uh, while doing intensive aquaculture but side by side we also want to conserve the natural environment and uh, the natural resources which are available and of course we want to mitigate or minimize the negative impact of the human activities so there are various uh, avenues various branches of this uh, green technology Today, definitely, being an aquaculturist, being a person related to uh, fish biology and aquaculture, I'd be concentrating on uh, the application of uh, green technologies or how we can mitigate uh, this uh, all intensified aquaculture, the negative effects of intensification of aquaculture. So, for green technology, there are definitely certain goals we want to achieve. Uh, some goals with associated with this development of green technology. But it's we want to maintain. Uh, we are talking about this sustainable development. Uh, there is uh, from very early days as well the concept of sustainability in terms of development has been there, uh, where we want to exploit the nature, maintaining uh, the resources for future utilization as well. We want to maintain the future need, uh, but of course. Uh, we are using the resources but keeping it like in a sense that it can also be used in future in order to do so often the cost of the energy in terms of green technologies uh, using different alternative sources uh, for energy production we are using different type of alternative fuels we are developing the technologies for development of fuels or alternative uh, energy resources we are trying to reduce the pollution and the waste uh, deposition uh, less pollution to the environment Uh, there are choice of different materials uh, which are easily available which are less polluting in nature to generate different type of uh, building materials or to generate a uh, different type of technological advancement and of course we are also looking for producing uh, new chemical products uh, that would be less hazardous that would be producing less amount of uh, waste in this regard so all these are different aspects the different goals related to uh, this green technology and when we are applying this sort of methodologies in aquaculture there is uh, the basic aspect is uh, related to a more sustainable practice 
and uh, safeguarding uh, the aquatic environment. You all know that the uh, aqu aquatic environment is very fragile in nature. There is always a scope. All these uh, pesticides, those are being used in land, all the different type of uh, polluting materials, ultimately they reach the aquatic system. Sorry? Excuse me. Uh, sir, slides are not moving. Slides are not moving. So, slides are not moving. Okay. Again. Yes, sir. So, uh, how far the slide has actually moved? Now it's okay. Now it's okay. Now it's open. Okay. Yes. So, uh, 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 has it moved to the next slide? Yes, sir. Now okay. Now open. Okay. So, again yeah so it's like when we are applying this uh, green technology in aquaculture the basic aspect is uh, to go for more sustainable practice and the objective would be to build the fragile aquatic environment uh, we all know that the, the, the aquatic environment is a uh, pretty fragile in nature in terms of all these uh, polluting substances are basically being ultimately getting deposited in the aquatic environment, changing the quality of the water and causing a great deal of pollution in the aquatic environment. So the basic aspect, the basic orientation of green technology uh, is related to uh, the development of uh, technologies or, or which should be more sustainable or development of practices which should be more sustainable, ultimately uh, maintaining the aquatic ecosystem. So just like you can think of in this uh, particular figure, as we are seeing here, uh, we use uh, for intensification of aquaculture system, we use highly nutritious food substances, which contain a high amount of nitrogen, highly proteinaceous food using a whole amount of fish meal, a lot of amount of fish meal is being employed in the fish feed industry. And uh, the fish feed are containing a huge amount of nitrogen in it. And all this can actually pollute the uh, aquatic environment. Then we are using more antibiotics, uh, more chemotherapeutics, uh, more supplementary feeding. And uh, these can actually lead to, if you are using greater amount of food than whatever is being required uh, during the course of aquatic management, uh, it would ultimately go for uh, increasing the NPK of the aquatic system, ultimately polluting the water. There can be chance of development of antibiotic resistant bacteria. A deposition of all these antibiotics and the pesticides in the aquatic system, which can ultimately target the non target species as well. The resultant would be a degraded aquatic environment. Green technology would just be, would be trying to mitigate all these problems, where we are looking for development of production of environmental friendly feed. Uh, the protein requirement for the aquatic uh, organisms or the, for the fishes would be maintained but still using less amount of more plant-based food substances, more plant-based supplementation in the food uh, or protein sources in the food, we can create a greater amount of environmental feed uh, for the fishes. We can use biofertilizers, which is easily degraded, not getting accumulated in the system. The biopesticides, different type of phytotherapeutic agents, so rather than using the chemosynthetic chemotherapeutics, that can be used. Uh, Bioflock technology, Perifyton or the aquaponics, so all these different type of green technologies which are uh, maintaining, uh, which are aimed to maintain the aquatic environment and uh, also maintaining the production level system. So that's the basic aspect of uh, this green technology in aquaculture. Now, as being a, a person who actually works on tilapia, uh, first I'd like to talk about something related to uh, tilapia as well, because as we all know in India, tilapia is not. Uh, I don't know whether how many of you are fond of eating tilapia, but uh, in India, it's uh, yet to gain its that, that particular species is yet to gain its gaining that popularity. But uh, there is much scope of improvement. But worldwide, if you look into the global aspect of uh, tilapia culture, uh, it is uh, one of the most commercially important group of uh, freshwater fish and food as aquaculture. Actually, uh, below the crop, it is the second most cultured species throughout the world. And uh, 
as we can see in this particular figure uh, the yellow portions are those who, are the countries uh, which are mainly the consumers as well as the principal producers of tilapia throughout the world and india is not actually that but in many tropical and subtropical countries that we are considered to be an important uh, food fish and uh, initially it has got a very low price uh, in india as well in west bengal to be more precise yeah uh, can you see the slide with what shows special of tilapia no sir slides are not moving sir constantly okay so let's just do this is it now moving Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Fine. So let's get it up. So uh, when we are talking about this importance of uh, tilapia, uh, the more the important aspect is initially it was thought to be the uh, poor man's uh, nutritional resource. Okay. So it was uh, having a low cost, but it is very rich in proteins. So of course, uh, all the even the lower schools, the people who are belonging uh, to the lower socio economic strata uh, they were also able to purchase and consume this high protein source and uh, one of the important aspect of tilapia culture is uh, this particular fish can be grown uh, at a wide variety of environmental conditions they can grow anywhere and everywhere so they were endemic or rather they are actually originating uh, from africa Uh, they are in their report the occurrence of tilapia has been done in ancient egyptian times as well actually in egyptian literature in egyptian uh, there's hieroglyphics there is mention of this particular uh, tilapia species and they were being consumed uh, from these ancient times and uh, if we look into the variety of tilapia species uh, they are mainly the oreochromis niloticus is one of the the nile tilapia the name is coming from over there Uh, which is most widely cultured tilapia species having a very high consumer demand as well throughout the world and uh, then oreochromis aureus is there the mozambique tilapia or oreochromis mozambicus if you uh, go to the market you will be seeing mostly two different type of tilapias one is uh, almost black in nature those are the mozambique tilapia which were introduced in india during uh, the 1970s first and then Some are there who are having black stripes over their body, comparatively less uh, black in color throughout the body, but uh, they are having stripes of black color stripes, which are being uh, the oreochromis niloticus, the Nile tilapia. Uh, the general fishermen they call it as Nilantica, and uh, the Mozambique tilapia has been found as the Mozambicus or Mozambique tilapia, and they are having certain type of specialities. So they are characters. There are certain specific characters which are pretty important with respect to uh, they are being chosen as an important uh, cultural species uh, their growth rate is very good they are having high growth rate they are very much uh, environmentally tolerant and resistant you can cultivate uh, from a wide variety of environment within a wide variety of environmental conditions as we have said that they have a high protein content as well being known as aquatic chicken Uh, being cultured almost everywhere, and the sale of tilapia is uh, increasing, like almost being doubled in ten years. In 2018, uh, there is a uh, 12 billion uh, US dollar. The sale percentage was like that, and 2028, it is being speculated that it would be doubled to reach over around 25 billion uh, US dollars. Now. This, if you look into the farm tilapia production uh, throughout the world from 1950s uh, to the 2020 onwards, as we can see in the graph, there is a gross rapid increase uh, over the years. Uh, during the early days, tilapia was not that much popular, so the production level was low. But since 1990 onwards, there is a huge leap. and uh, we are finding that a huge amount of tilapia is now it is being produced and as you can see uh, the growth pattern of tilapia in this case is in terms of uh, the monetary gain as well there is a huge amount of tilapia uh, economics being involved in the tilapia production so you can uh, look into the contribution of aquaculture to tilapia production we can find that a huge amount of money is also being involved rather in the tilapia culture rather than wild capture of tilapia 
the wild tilapia capture is the blue one which remains almost the uh, same over the years but as we can see the yellow bars uh, they are increasing day by day over the years the tilapia industry has become uh, increased a lot uh, has the side blue yes sir it's okay now you continue okay fine okay. so uh, now looking into these graphs are actually showing the tilapia culture orientation uh, in different regions throughout the world uh, so that at the topmost left in the developed countries then in the developing ones the less developed ones as we are seeing here in every if you just look into the different economic strata with respect to uh, uh, throughout the world all the different uh, countries are actually producing tilapia and th there is a huge scope of industry with respect to tilapia culture and the developing regions of course uh, china being the major uh, player here uh, they are the highest producer throughout the world the tilapia production at china is uh, definitely the highest and in terms of the less developed countries or the least developed countries along with southeast asia Uh, Bangladesh is the world country which is producing a huge amount of uh, tilapia. So, although uh, this particular species, uh, the home of this species is in Africa, but uh, they have gained popularity throughout the world, and different countries are producing or and consuming as well as consuming tilapia to a great extent. Uh, among the developed countries, USA is uh, actually the most uh, producing country. Then. Uh, in the china is the most producing country among the developing region bangladesh is the one which is among the least developed countries now uh, coming to the southeastern asia as we have said that bangladesh followed by sri lanka and interestingly sir, india is nowhere sir excuse me uh, yeah now it's the 11th slide we could not visualize uh, now we move to 12 Uh, number 11 slide yeah you, so you are not able to see the, uh, not can you see the 11 slide now yeah 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 now okay fine. Okay. Uh, okay so that's what i mean. so just uh, let me know because there are certain problems related to my connectivity i think that's why it's not actually working so that must be properly uh, So the, in the eleventh slide, as we are discussing about, there's a different uh, group of uh, countries with respect to the developed ones, the developing ones, as well as the uh, uh, least developed countries. And as we can see, altogether throughout the world, China is the highest producer, and it's actually uh, highest by a very wide margin, for that matter. So if we look into the lower right panel. the top uh, 10 largest tilapia aquaculture countries in asia as you can see uh, uh, china is producing uh, the highest amount of tilapia all over the world and also in terms of uh, uh, its uh, monetary gain as well uh, followed by throughout the world uh, usa is the second uh, producer of tilapia and then uh, among the least developed countries bangladesh is the one and in the 12th slide we are talking about uh, this uh, southeastern countries which are the largest tilapia aquaculture producing countries and the first one is definitely bangladesh uh, followed by sri lanka nepal and pakistan are also having a very less amount of uh, tilapia production but india actually comes nowhere in this uh, regard and as we can see here over the years starting from 2000 to 2018 we can see that the uh, price level or the economic orientation If we look into the valuation of tilapia industry, that has also increased over the years. So that's the importance of tilapia globally in terms of both production as well as in terms of economic gain. So have we moved to slide thirteen now? Yes, sir. Could it be Can possible to back your uh, slide? Uh, pardon, two. two? Would it be possible to maximize your slide screen? Yeah, th th that's what I have done. I have maximized the slides. Isn't it there? Okay, okay, sir. Main continue. Okay, sir. Actually, it's fine. Because I'm not actually able to. Let's wait a second. Yes. 
Okay, I think it's better now. Yes, sir. Somewhat better. You continue, sir, please. Okay, uh, so there's in India, if we look into the aquaculture scenario, what we are finding is uh, that we mostly prefer tapla as uh, our choice of food. So the culture of the India, if we look into the production of Indian aquaculture in terms of uh, the production quantity, uh, Katla is the predominant one, followed by Lebio Rohitra, and uh, then the freshwater fishes, the white leg swim, like this. Uh, and in terms of uh, monetary the production value, uh, again, Katla is the dominating one, followed by white leg swim. And uh, Tilapia is actually nowhere in this uh, aspect. We, we don't. Uh, uh, have that in that much of consumption as well as in terms of the uh, monetary orientation uh, by with respect to quantity and by value, uh, tilapia is uh, in India. Tilapia is not that much coveted, uh, but as we are talking about that tilapia being very versatile in terms of coping up with different type of environmental conditions and the management requirement for tilapia culture is also pretty low. So it's pretty simple, pretty easy uh, to culture tilapia uh, in different conditions. So there is always a scope if you want to intensify, if you want to utilize the different aquatic resources or different aquatic habitats, uh, we can have, we can use tilapia as the choice of our species. So that's why uh, tilapia has been introduced in India in order to fill up the vetted niches available in the aquatic system and in order to increase the productivity. So in this aspect, tilapia culture was uh, being introduced, or the concept of tilapia culture is being introduced in India. Share the screen. The problem is in my part, it is changing, but it's not changing when I'm looking for the presentation. Now. Now we can visualize like 14, sir. Yeah, that's the uh, one. So you can visualize like 14. So as we look into the tilapia production in India in this uh, regard, uh, so the production of tilapia over the years has increased, definitely, as you can see, from 2009 uh, to 2020. There is a, a gradual increase in tilapia production, and we are hoping that uh, it can. Uh, act as a game changer with respect to the more demand of fish. So we are consuming, people of India are consuming more fish. Uh, and being hardy in nature, being, can, it can exploit different sort of environmental conditions. So we are hoping that tilapia can actually act like a game changer uh, to orient its, uh, the production level in Indian aquaculture system. Now, coming to the India's export of tilapia products, though we are playing net, but there is always a scope of improvement because we have a great deal of aquatic resources, the different water bodies that there, and all these multiple water bodies we can culture tilapia, of course, judicial would be coming to that, the judicial aquaculture or judicial tilapia culture. So as you can see in this particular uh, slide, that mostly we export uh, the different type of tilapia products where the maximum amount of uh, tilapia export are actually in the form of uh, 
frozen whole tilapia. So almost 97% of uh, export uh, the tilapia that is being exported from India is in the form of uh, whole frozen. Uh, but there is always a scope that if we produce a uh, large size tilapia, we can also export the fresh filet or the frozen filet and also be exported. So there is always a market of tilapia filet as well, uh, which can be exploited if sufficient large amount or large size tilapia can actually be produced. Now, mostly are these species of tilapia are being cultured in India. Uh, the Nile tilapia is the mostly coveted one, Nylon tikka, followed by Mozambique tilapia, or, uh, which is generally being called as tilapia. And nowadays the crossbreed uh, the blue tilapia, tilapia aureus, now we have come as aureus, and the red tilapia uh, are uh, also being cultured. Now, there is a concept that gift is being there. Uh, gift is a genetically more improved form of tilapia being generated through uh, cross uh, breeding, uh, through hybridization uh, mechanism. They are having a greater growth potential compared to others. And if we look into the uh, cultured species orientation, as you can see, uh, the Nile tilapia being the major one, uh, followed by Mozambique and the other tilapias. Now, as we are talking about the tilapia, they were preferring uh, to live in different uh, type of uh, environmental condition as well. They are tropical species. Uh, they have a certain preferred temperature of around uh, 31 to 36 degrees centigrade, but they can tolerate uh, even low temperature as low as 11 to 12 degrees centigrade and uh, they can tolerate temperature as high as 42 to the centigrade. So you can understand that they can survive at least over a wide range of environmental conditions. Uh, but of course, uh, the optimal condition being around uh, the, this particular region. So this, they can tolerate a great deal of salinity of up to 36. Often tilapia has been cultured in the saline water as well. And even the marine culture of tilapia has been introduced in different countries. Uh, their optimum salinity for growth is definitely around uh, 90. So they can survive at a dissolved oxygen level of down to 0.1 mg per liter. But definitely, they can survive at that level. But the optimum range is more than 3. Temperature, as we have talked about, around 29 to 30 degrees is the optimum for them. Their pH is from 7 to 9 and the ammonia level is less than 0 0.05. But again, they are highly tolerant to even the polluting water. So that's the most important aspect of uh, tilapia culture, that we can introduce tilapia to any sort of aquatic environment and hope that uh, they would definitely survive, and they would also reproduce. Uh, but then, if uh, they are all uh, that good, why tilapia culture is not yet uh, being governed or advocated uh, by different type of regulating agencies. Uh, there are certain problems associated with tilapia culture. Well, it says that tilapia are very, as we can have seen already, that they can survive or they can tolerate a wide range of fluctuations in environmental conditions. So they can exploit a different type of environmental conditions much better compared to the local indigenous species. And they are highly prolific breeders in nature. In different environmental conditions, they can breed and they can breed at very small size. Actually, what happens when they are being put under very hostile conditions, often they just stop growth, but they start breeding, uh, filling up the entire water body with a huge number of small sized uh, population. So that is where the problem comes from. We all want to have higher production in terms of increased size of the species, not in terms of having a wide, a whole lot of small sized individuals, but rather you want that there would be a good size species from where we can obtain the fillet and we can also maintain a certain amount of export quality production. But that is not what is happening with this particular species. Often tilapia introduction in an aquatic body have resulted in the reduction of average weight of the INCs. And uh, they are also posing threat to their existence in the aquatic system. They are exploiting the environment much better compared to the INCs, reducing the production level of the INC in the aquatic system. And uh, 
say for example being an aquaculturist i want to put my management system for around 100 uh, or 100 individuals being introduced into the pond but tilapia being highly prolific breeders they would actually within a very few months uh, produce say 500 species individuals within that pond you are having a system you are wanting to manage the system with 100 individuals now you are having 500 individuals so automatically the entire management system goes completely okay. so that is again another problem and along with this increased stocking density of course there will be growth retardation so you are hoping that at the end of the day at the time of harvest you'll be getting fish of around 200 gram of weight and now you are getting a fish of around uh, 20 to 30 gram of weight so that's the major problem with uh, tilapia culture and in order to solve that often a monosex or all male tilapia culture is being introduced okay. now when we are talking about this all male or monosex tilapia culture the question comes why male because in tilapia the males they do grow bigger compared to that of females so by introducing this all male tilapia in an aquatic system we are actually having uh, resolving two issues we are resolving the issue of uh, prolific breeding there is no female so there is no point of increasing in number and the males they would grow bigger in size as well as they would grow uniformly ultimately leading to a better production so that's why for tilapia culture you are having uh, all male monosex culture so the advantage of mixed sex culture was actually it is pretty easy you just throw the fishes in the aquatic system they would grow but the disadvantage would be as we have discussed small harvest rate and mixed size of harvest while the monosex culture there will be large harvest rate uniform size at harvest but of course you need to generate mechanism in order to produce this monosex fish so there are various ways of producing uh, monosex uh, fishes we can go for visually selected fish we can apply the method of hybridization crossing to different species uh, with each other producing all male population we can go for genetic manipulation uh, produce transgenics and uh, everything or produce yy type of super males uh, and we have a mechanism of sex reversal uh, considering all the difficulties associated the technicalities associated with all these that the expertise book work for all these mechanism sex reversal is actually uh, the most uh, the easiest one to do so now as we can see here figure the male and the female tilapias can be easily distinguished from each other besides the males being bigger in uh, size if we look into the genital papillary region of the fish <laughs> we can identify the males and the females the female would actually have three different openings the anus the ovida and the urinary pore so the genital opening are separate uh, from that of the uh, urinary pore while for males the opening is one so there is only a single common urinary genital pore along with the anus so at the genital papillary region we would be seeing that for males there would be two openings the anus and the common urinary genital pore while the female there would be three opening the anus the ovida and the urinary pore so you can see in this figure as well uh, the left one uh, having a anus and the single genital pore is the male while the right one is the uh, female having three openings over the genital papillary region now sex reversal in tilapia can be uh, done uh, with respect to use of different type of chemotherapeutic agents uh, mostly uh, the hormones we use a whole lot of uh, synthetic steroids uh, for production of uh, all male tilapia now there is another way in this aspect as well uh, besides uh, giving the tilapia the male hormones the male synthetic hormones like selenium alpha methyl testosterone we can do one thing in terms of sex reversal where the female cells being uh, produced into male and then uh, those females uh, which are being sex reversed Uh, the feminizer uh, can be done, or on the other hand, what we can do is we can cause feminization of the males, producing X Y female, and crossing that female with X Y male, there is a chance that uh, they would be producing Y Y type of uh, all male population. So that is one of the aspects uh, where uh, we can actually cause 
produce wide-wide super males in tilapia by doing feminization of the genetic male and then the functional males, uh, females being mated with uh, genotypic males. But that's a more complex thing. You'll be getting the uh, male tilapia in the next generation. But if you want to produce tilapia, male tilapia, all male tilapia population in the first generation itself, we can take a small size of an average, uh, like uh, within 10 days of file can be taken, and those would be treated with synthetic hormones like 17 alpha methyl testosterone. And genetically, they would remain thinner, but phenotypically, they would grow into males. So they are phenotypic characters. Their development of the gonadal structure would be like that of males. But their genotype is not changing. So it is not a transgenic. There is no, we are not manipulating the genes of the uh, individual. Rather, we are just applying exogenous hormone uh, to reorient the course of gonadal differentiation. So the genetic females can be transformed into uh, phenotypic males by this sex reversal method. And the hormones can be applied either through dietary supplementation. We can immerse the fry into the uh, solution of the hormone, or we can inject the hormone into the fry. But of course, we can understand of all these different methods, the dietary supplementation would be the easiest one to uh, perform. And we can actually, uh, more easily, we can uh, do this type of method. So, as we have already said, that uh, the 17 alpha methyl testosterone is actually the most. Uh, important or most widely used type of steroid hormone which is uh, being employed for uh, production of all male and monosex therapy. And uh, I, during my PhD days, have started uh, with working with this 17 alpha MT, where different doses of 17 alpha MT were being administered for uh, different uh, durations, different period of administration was there. And as you can see here, uh, the 10 mg per kg of food for around 30 days of application actually yielded almost 95% uh, uh, of uh, males. And we have seen that there is uh, not only high production of males, but also growth enhancement was there. The males are growing bigger uh, with respect to an increased expression of androgen receptor, uh, both in terms of the MRNA level as well as in terms of protein level. Uh, promoting growth and masculinization in this tilapia. So there is a production of uh, all male tilapia in an age, dose, and duration specific manner by application of 17 alpha age. And worldwide, mostly people are producing uh, monosex tilapia by application of this particular hormone. Then what's the problem? Now, that is not green technology. That is the pro there are certain problems with this chemosynthetic, use of this chemosynthetic agents. Uh, the most important issue is often related to the ethical issues. I have been asked uh, this question that if we are consuming uh, this fish who have been treated with uh, different doses or hormones or male hormones, what would happen to the females when they are consuming uh, the fish? Will there be a problem related to consumption of this type of hormone treated fish? What would be the residual effect of the hormone uh, in the fish itself or in the aquatic environment? So there can be ecological issues, there can be ethical issues, there can be health hazards, and several works have been conducted in this regard as well. So many people have worked in this aspect that uh, what would actually happen whenever we are using uh, these uh, different type of MPs or different chemotherapeutic agents in tilapia. So considering this, we looked, we searched uh, different uh, literature and tried to find out a phytoremediation, uh, use of certain uh, phytochemicals or certain molecular plant bioactive components or plant extract for that matter, which can be used for production of uh, monosex tilapia. And why these phytochemicals are being important? Because it can be considered to be a safe alternative to these hazardous and uh, uh, synthetic sterols. They, they are regarded to be environmental friendly uh, compared to that of the uh, synthetic steroids, and they can be used in a more eco friendly manner as a component of green technology. So, a possible alternative approach to it rather than using synthetic steroids 
is uh, the utilization of plant extract containing different types of phytochemicals to produce monosexual abuse. So in this regard, in uh, my lab, we have worked with uh, different uh, type of uh, plant products for production of uh, this monosex tilapia. Like we have used basil alba, the leaves, uh, spinach, we all know the Malabar spinach, uh, then the chlorophytum bolvialum, uh, the roots of this sophid muesli, these are again the common name are this, the sophid muesli, the nuclear periods, the seeds, the alpushi, these have been termed. Uh, the asparagus racemosis or uh, the uh, shatomuli, we call it, and uh, as the literature, or in Bangla Bengali, we call it as shatomuli. Then Uithania, Ashwagandha, a pretty common sort of uh, herbal plant, and Tribulus or Gokula. So these are all pretty common plants being available throughout our country. Uh, they are being spread throughout the country, easily available in West Bengal as well. And uh, these products, they have been reported in literature to have some aphrodisiac and androgenic effects. They are being, in our ethnic literature, they are being often used uh, for remediation of different uh, or different vulnerable ailments in uh, males. So in this, uh, taking cue from those literature, we have tried to work on uh, whether these things can also be employed for production of monosex tilapia. The basic mechanism related to this production would be this, uh, take the plant substance, grind it, uh, and uh, extract the uh, grounded plant material with a different type of solvent, you need to choose the solvent, you need to test whether which of the solvent would actually be able to produce maximum amount of functional efficacy. Then uh, we are going for isolating our preparation of this extract uh, through different methods, drying the extract in software, and then uh, uh, determine the dose which in, with which it can be applied within the food. So ultimately, the goal is to prepare a plant extract fortified food, which can be given uh, to the tilapia fly uh, during a particular course of its development and ultimately resulting in uh, production of monosex tilapia. So that's the work we are doing in our lab. We have uh, produced this type of plant extract fortified food and tried to look for what sort of uh, effect they are having in terms of uh, monosex tilapia production. So as you can see in this particular figure, what we need to do is we should collect the tilapia fly. So these particular species are mouth breeders. So what they do after the eggs are being fertilized, the females, <laughs> they take the fertilized egg in their mouth. And inside the mouth, uh, the fertilized eggs, they grow and ultimately uh, they are hatching out. After being hatched out, the small fries are released from their mouth. and it's a, there is an interesting behavioral phenomenon that whenever these small flies they feel threatened, they can also go back to their mother's mouth and reside there. Uh, but often, uh, once uh, these mouths have been released from the mother's, uh, or these flies have been released from the mother's mouth, we are collecting these uh, flies and treating them with our uh, hormone or plant extract fortified feed. Okay. So we are providing them feed uh, with which are being fortified with this plant extract for a certain period of time and ultimately growing there and trying to find out uh, whether they have been developed into males or not. As you can see, this is the basic mechanism, the basic methodology of what we are following. We are collecting the fish, uh, the just has juveniles, as you can see, this type of small size flies are being collected and uh, the plant extract which is uh, being prepared are <laughs> the flies are being treated either through immersion or through dietary supplementation. A dietary supplementation can either be done through powdered plant material or through the extract. And after a certain period of administration, we do the sexing. So there is a simple method of uh, taking out the uh, gonads, washing it with acetocarmine stain, and then looking for the structural orientation of the uh, gonad, whether they are being changed into male or females. So here are some pictorial representation. As you can see here, uh, the fish containing the eggs in their mouth. And they are releasing the eggs. We can collect the egg as well. And we can collect the fries as well. So fries can be collected. We can also uh, collect the egg. We are now working on this 
egg itself, we, can, we are trying to go, in, go on with the process where egg would be treated with a different type of extract. Now, uh, these flies, they are being treated with, they are being fed with uh, plant extract fortified diets, and we are looking uh, what sort of uh, change that can take place by application of this. So, as we can see in this figure, we can identify the gonad uh, just by looking into the seminiferous tubular structure in males can be easily identified after you know, squashing and uh, looking at the gonadal structure. The female can be identified through the presence of these mosaics. And uh, the efficacy of the extract, whether it has actually working or not, you can always say that, okay, it is the females are having female structure, the males are having male structure. How do you know that uh, the plant extract is uh, efficient to cause reversal? So that we can just simply look into by looking into the structure of uh, this intersex where we are finding both the seminiferous tubule as well as the site like organization. So that indicates that, okay, our treatment is uh, more or less uh, fine. They are actually causing uh, sex reversal in uh, genotypic females and leading them towards uh, production of males. So, as we have said, they are using different type of uh, plant extract material with uh, different sort of uh, solvent. We have used aqueous, methanol, ethanol, dichloromethane, hexane. Uh, all these different type of solvents are being used with different concentrations. And we have found that uh, the control fish, where there was no fortification of the diet with the plant extract, they almost showed around the general pattern uh, of you know tilapia population. Uh, the sex ratio is around 60 to 40 with female to male. So they are showing 60% females and 40% males in general. But after administration of uh, this plant extract fortified diet, there is uh, definitely an increase in uh, maleness. The proportion of male in the population has actually increased. And we are finding for Dazzala alba, uh, the maximum amount of uh, male were being obtained for ethanol extract at 1 gram per, per kg feed concentration. While for tribunus terrestris, we have obtained the maximum amount of uh, male in, at a concentration of 1.5 gram per uh, kg feed. So as we are saying, there, we have used three different concentrations initially, 0.5, 1, and 1.5. And as in tribunus, we have obtained uh, the highest percentage of male in 1.5 gram per kg. We also increase the concentration. So trying to find out okay, if there is an increase in male percentage, by increasing the concentration of uh, plant extract in the field. And have say, having said that, we found that yes, the concentration of increase, uh, the male concentration of increase in 2 gram per kg field, but then again it has decreased. Now it's an interesting phenomenon. We are not only, not always, we are getting a sort of linear relationship between the concentration of the extract with that of the percentage of males. We cannot just say that you go on increasing the concentration of the extract and you'll be getting a better result in terms of uh, adding more number of males. That never happens. Even with uh, hormone, the 17 alpha MT, often we are seeing that uh, people are just indiscriminately using the concentration of the hormone without thinking that what should be the effect of that. But not necessarily by increasing the concentration, you'll be getting better results. So with respect to asparagus and uh, leucuna as well, we are finding that a particular concentration of 2 gram per kg feed for both leucuna and uh, asparagus, we are having the highest percentage of males. But interestingly, the solvent is no longer ethanol, but it is methanol. So the methanol concentration has 0.2 uh, gram per kg concentration are providing the maximum concentration or maximum percentage of uh, males for asparagus and uh, uh, leucuna. For Uh, as we have said, that how long to administer this sort of uh, treatment? So we also went through for different duration of administration and found that more or less uh, 30 days of treatment is enough to produce the maximum amount of uh, male percentage. So whatever is the orientation of uh, the plan, whenever you are using them for around 30 days, you are getting a maximum amount of male percentage. Beyond that, either the level remains same or there is slight decrease in percentage of male population. 
So indicating that uh, for this particular treatment, we can actually look for a uh, sort of 30 days treatment duration. So we can ultimately for our six different uh, plants products that we have used for uh, this percentage of maize, the bacillary alpha leaves, we are getting ethanol at uh, <coughs> one gram per kg, five the sewer space at uh, 0.2. Or two gram, sorry, the micronutrients uh, also 0.2, asparagus resinosis for 0.2, ruthania 0.75, and uh, borivalum uh, clofitum for 0.75. So we are having the maximum amount of male percentages with different sort of solvents and different type of uh, concentration. Now, these are certain pictorial orientations. Now, once we have obtained that, okay, fine, we are getting. Uh, a good amount of male percentage by fitting with uh, this uh, plant extract fortified diet. What about their growth potential? So we went on uh, doing a growth study. Okay, we have used them, uh, this fortified feed for 30 days, followed by normal feeding for another three months. So the total duration of culture was for four months because more or less in uh, nature, in the uh, condition of agriculture system, uh, the aqua farmers, the culture will appear for about four months or so, not beyond that. So we have restricted our culture period for four months and tried to look for whether the fishes are gaining a more growth advantage or they are becoming more virile in nature, they are becoming more immunostimulated uh, after the administration of this plant extract fortified feed. Uh, our ultimate goal was to produce healthy monosex tilapia uh, through green technology. So uh, we have uh, used, we have produced our feed, we have uh, cultured them in different systems and the berries in uh, small hoppers as well. And ultimately, uh, these are all different pictures related to our uh, culture systems. We have used these type of small ponds on our experimental ponds as well. And uh, these are the growth orientation. As you can see here, by treating with this, uh, plant extract fortified diet, we are getting considerable growth advantage at the end of four months compared to the control. And uh, it is uh, comparable to that whatever can be achieved through application of the hormone. So that was other objective of our study as well, whether we are gaining a growth advantage, which, is, which can we can compare with that of the uh, monosex tilapia produced through hormone administration. Okay. So green technology, Okay, can ultimately replace uh, this type of uh, chemotherapy with application. The production level has also been increased in this uh, regard. Then the same thing happened with asparagus and mucuna, but interesting observation has been made for mucuna. You can see here this figure. Till 60 days to 75 days, both mucuna and asparagus, the red one is the asparagus and the green one is the mucuna, they were showing increased growth pattern <coughs> compared to the control. But beyond 75 days, an interesting observation was made where uh, the mucuna treated or mucuna fed fish, which are fed with mucuna supplemented diet for the initial 30 days, uh, they actually showed reduced growth rate. So their growth pattern become more or less similar to that of the control and ultimately at the end of 120 days, uh, their growth was uh, similar uh, to the control. Whereas uh, the asparagus fed fish, we are showing a huge amount of greater growth. As you can see in the production level as well, the production of mucuna, the AMM, with that of control is almost same. Whereas uh, asparagus is showing a greater amount of uh, growth pattern. Now, we tried to find out the result and uh, observe an interesting thing. That though the mucin treated males at the end of 120 days were apparently showing male characters. So, they are, just look at their uh, tail. That their caudal fin is, having, is being red. The dorsal fin is showing redness of color, which are indicative of maleness. But uh, once we dissected the fish, we are finding that they have generated oval. <laughs> so interestingly, at the end of 120 days, the ratio of sex, the male is to female ratio in the mucuna treated fish was not similar to what we have observed after 30 days. 
So after 30 days, we have seen that, okay, more than 90% are less when we have tested. But after 120 days, we have found that the male percentage in the mucuna was almost around 55 to 60%, like that in control. So we can assume that the functional potentiality, the efficacy of mucuna to sustain the maleness in the tilapia is not that good. So the other plant materials, they are able to produce maleness, induce maleness, and sustain it over a long period of time. Whereas for mucuna, <laughs> the sustenance of maleness in the fish were not that. They are not able to maintain the characteristic features of the males. Uh, the female, so the gonads were again reversing back to their original genotypic sex, and that's why the growth pattern uh, has been reduced. The growth rate has been reduced. Uh, finally, leading to this uh, decreased uh, growth. But again, for withania and chlorophyton, we have seen that uh, fine. There is increased growth, and they maintain their wellness, and they are showing higher male percentage compared to that of the females. And growth percentage was also uh, pretty high. So, as you can see in this particular table, uh, the at the end of eight. 120 days, the control was gaining at around 90 gram or 85 gram of weight, whereas all the other plant extract fortified uh, fish, uh, they were having around 150 to 160 gram of weight, while the mucuna were uh, having similar weight like that of uh, the control, around 90 gram. So not only in terms of uh, this uh, growth, but also in terms of uh, the immunological aspects, the plant extract fortified uh, or plant extract fed fish, they're <laughs> immunologically more uh, better. Uh, they are showing greater phagocytic activities, respiratory burst, uh, total protein content was high, total immunological content was high, serial isosome activity was better compared to that of the control in uh, the plant extract fortified fish. For all these uh, six different type of uh, fortification, we are showing that, okay, the plant extract fed fish, they were showing greater immunological functions okay, they, compared to that of the control one. And we have also the hematological parameters were better uh, compared to the control. So they are more immunostimulated, they are more resilient against disease. We have also used uh, tested their resilience against Aramonas hydrophilum. We have treated, the, we have fed the fish with this plant extract fortified diet, and after a certain period of such feeding, we have uh, challenged them with Aramonas hydrophilum, one of the most potent pathogens in aquaculture system, and found that the fish which have been fed with uh, this plant extract fortified diet, they are actually showing greater amounts of resilience and better protection against uh, Aramonas infection compared to the control fish. So in different sort of environment where there is a chance that the fish can be exposed to different type of pathogens, this plant extract uh, 45, so we are actually reducing uh, the use of the scope of using there's a different type of antibiotics or different type of chemotherapeutic uh, agents uh, during aquaculture. So by this plant extract fortification through this green technological method, uh, we can limit uh, the use of, or we can mitigate the ill effects of using all these antibiotic orientations in uh, fish aquaculture. Uh, leading to what sort of uh, efficacy, functional efficacy can be there, we have also looked for uh, certain type of growth hormones, like growth hormone or insulin-like growth factor, and different type of interleukins, and uh, have observed that, yes, the plant extract fortified diet uh, they are not only promoting wellness, but they are also promoting secretion of different growth factors, uh, ultimately leading to an increased growth in uh, plant extract fortified uh, fishes compared to that of the uh, control. And uh, nowadays, we are actually uh, going for different sort of combination, testing different type of combinations related to this uh, plant extract fortified diet. and. Uh, we have also achieved around 500 grams of uh, fish development growth uh, within 120 days by uh, certain type of plant extract fortification, combined plant extract fortifications, and also there is application for patent in this uh, regard as well.
Now, the last part of our study is basically related to the causal effect. As we have said, that okay, fine, we are doing this sort of things and uh, uh, gaining more advanced uh, sort of growth and everything. But what are the principal phyto constituents? Can we pinpoint certain type of uh, constituents being associated with uh, this functional efficacy? So, in order to do so, what we can actually do is uh, the extract uh, can be subjected to sort of a bioactivity guided fractionation. So we are doing PLCs, uh, column chromatography uh, to fractionate the uh, food plant extract. And then with these different fractions, we are preparing the feed and uh, just uh, going for the bioactivity assay by feeding the fish with a different type of these uh, this fractions. And then looking for what would be the which of the fraction is providing maximum sort of maleness. And once we have isolated that particular fraction, which would produce the maximum amount of maleness in fish, we are going for further uh, identification of the phytochemical constituent, bioactive phytoconstituent, by GCMS or LCMS or HPLC sort of study. And uh, trying to find out uh, what sort of components are being there, and then uh, do certain type of data mining through in silico studies to find out what would be the functional mechanism uh, behind that sort of uh, functional efficacy of uh, these uh, different components. So looking into the, initially we do a sort of uh, gross phytochemical screening. As you can see, uh, the most uh, important extracts like basula ethanol, fibrillus ethanol, and uh, chlorophyta methanol, while asparagus methanol and methania from methanol extract, they show presence of different group of phytochemicals like tannins, saponins, alkaloids, glycosides, flavonoids, and steroids. All these uh, different extracts, they have one thing in common that they all contain steroids in them. Uh, phytosteroids uh, or flavonoids are being present in all of them, and all of them also contain flavonoid. So this actually in one turn can indicate their uh, efficacy in terms of promoting uh, immunity in fish as well as promoting maleness in fish. The steroids may be responsible for uh, <laughs> promoting uh, maleness, while the flavonoids, we all know we consume flavonoid as a potent antioxidant. Uh, th these may be an uh, important factor behind the uh, immunostimulating efficacy of those uh, plant extracts. Uh, then simply, we have done, as we have said, that this activity guided fractionation and tried to look for uh, what are the different percentages of males uh, being uh, after being uh, for, fed with plant extract fortified diet. And we have isolated those particular fractions <coughs> which showed the maximum amount of maleness in uh, tilapia itself. And after GCMS study, uh, as we are seeing here, for Bazella, we got 41 principal phytoconstituents uh, to be isolated of which, uh, with respect to the percentage amount and the functional efficacy, is phenol 24 one one dimethyl uh, that was uh, found to be the most uh, prominent one in Basila. Uh, the same component uh, is also being found in uh, tribulus, along with some others like 9-12 octadecanoic acids or oleic acids in them for asparagus. There is also presence of this 2,4, uh, phenol 2,4, this 1,1 one, one dimethyl ethyl along with one uh, hexadecine. Uh, in case of nucleona, uh, we didn't get this phenol 1 to this uh, dimethylethyl, but rather we get an isomer of that, a phenol 2 6 this uh, 1 1 dimethylethyl. So, nucleona, it didn't have uh, phenol 1 4, the phenol 2 4, uh, sorry, 2 4 this 1 1 dimethylethyl, but it contained phenol 2 6 this 1 1 dimethylethyl. So, I'm harping on that fact because maybe uh, the functional potency we thought that, okay. The, the difference in terms of functional potency may be related to this uh, presence of this isomer rather than the original uh, uh, molecule being over there. In uh, withania also, we got um, 41 compounds. Uh, the principal ones were actually the fatty acids like panitic acids, while in uh, suffered muesli, we have also got uh, different type of fatty acids uh, like oleic acid and uh, xanthotoxins as the principal uh, phytoconstituents. Now, once uh, the principal phytoconstituents have been uh, identified, uh, the mechanism, we thought of two things. It can either 
they are induced in maleness. How? The question was being asked. Now, it can happen that they are reducing the functional efficacy of aromatase enzyme. This is actually the enzyme converting uh, the testosterone into estrogen. So, by downregulating the conversion of uh, uh, testosterone into estrogen, uh, maybe uh, these plant extracts are inducing their androgenic effect. Or they may also reduce production of 17 beta estradiol or reduce the function of or the activity of estrogen receptor. While they can also increase the functional activity of androgen receptor or the level of 11 keto testosterone, which is the most potent type of uh, testosterone or androgen in fishes. So these are the two aspects which we have looked for whether there is down regulation of aromatase activity or application of uh, 11 KT and AR level. These were our objective of the subsequent amount, subsequent level of study. And we have found that through beta mining that okay, phenol 2 for this 1 1 dimethyl is actually a reported aromatase inhibitor. So they have aromatase inhibitory activity. Uh, so maybe the, the presence of this particular component in uh, this different type of phyto or uh, plant extracts are actually the reason behind their functional efficacy. On the other hand, components like 9,2 octadecanidicanonic acid or oleic acids, uh, these are agonists to androgen receptor. They may promote the androgen receptor activity. Or they can inhibit 17 beta HSD production and antagonist to estrogen receptor. So altogether, our results that we have obtained through the uh, weight lab study is being uh, validated through our uh, dry lab in silico analysis as well. So we have uh, checked out for the level of 11 testosterone and estradiol in fish from different different groups and have been it's been observed that but yes that was that is what is happening for control male as we can see the level of this uh, 11 kt is uh, the white part is pretty high which is also true for all these different type of plant extract fortified feed but look at the control level where the 11 kt level was very low and the ET level was high. So, our valid, these sort of results were actually validating the functional efficacy of these plant extracts. We have also looked for the fold changes in terms of with respect to the control thinner. How much aromatase activity was there in uh, plant extract 45 in the gonads of these plant extract fed fishes? And we have found that, okay, all these uh, plant extract 45 uh, fish were actually showing a greater degree of uh, down regulated aromatic expression with respect to control thinning. So all the results are indicative that, okay, they are having some sort of uh, anti-aromatase uh, activity. Uh, in the same way, we have checked out whether there is an, uh, in terms of protein expression with respect to aromatase, androgen receptor, and estrogen receptor, and found that, yes, uh, for this different uh, group of plant extracted fish, uh, there is a reduced level of uh, Aromatase uh, activity compared to that of the control female, while the androgen receptor activity has been increased, but uh, the estrogen receptor activity has decreased in all these uh, plant extract uh, fish. So that's uh, compared to that of uh, the control female. So this is another type of validation that can be made. So uh, the same study has been conducted with respect to the mRNA expression level as well. We have done some sort of uh, ISH uh, with respect to this 3 beta HSD localization in the gonad and find the differential expression of uh, this uh, 3 beta HSD, which is an important uh, enzyme related to androgen production in uh, fishes. And we have found that, okay, in case of our treated males, the expression level of this 3 beta HSD in the gonad has increased compared to that in the control feeder. So all these are uh, indicative enough that, okay, the plant extract uh, 45 diet is actually providing <laughs> a greater sort of uh, functional efficacy with respect to inducing maleness. And as we have said that we have done some data mining with respect to in silico analysis as well to find out the interacting effect of these principal phytoconstituents with uh, aromatase mainly, as uh, aromatase inhibition is one of the important functional tool uh, for uh, inducing wellness. So we have looked for that. We have uh, looked into the uh, isolated component and uh, searched the database for finding out their interaction 
is the receptor. Okay, so the receptor ligand and the interactivity has been conducted. And the other goal was uh, to find out whether uh, these plant extracts are actually containing different type of bioactive constituents which can be used for uh, development of drugs as well in future. So whether they have the potentiality of uh, being used as a drug. And we have found that the three principal phytoconstituents, there is uh, OD, uh, the <laughs> phenol 2,4 base, the PD, OD is the one octadecasin, and uh, the 9,12 octadecadionic acid or ODDA. So you have uh, done certain type of in silico analytical study uh, to find out whether these particular components have the ability of binding with the functional domain of the aromatase enzyme. And we have found that with differential efficacy, these particular components, these ligands, are actually being able to bind with the functional domain of aromatase, thereby preventing uh, the aromatase function or aromatase activity. So these components can be used as anti aromatase uh, molecule itself. And uh, looking into the bioavailability for any type of uh, drug delivery, the most important aspect would be to look for whether uh, these particular components are reaching uh, the target organ and they are being available at the target organ for a longer period of time to elicit their function. This was the most important aspect. Now, this is uh, what we can be found with PD. So we have checked through this uh, data mining that or through this in silico study that whether these components are being able to reach the target at an adequate concentration and whether they are able to be persistent enough for at that target for a sufficient amount of time. And so in order to do so, there is a rule of five, as we can all know, whoever is working with this uh, drug development uh, sort of study, they'll be knowing that in order to be a useful drug, uh, a particular molecule, uh, should have certain characters. Okay. So their molecular weight should be less than around uh, 500 Dalton. Their log P should be less than around 5. Uh, the hydrogen bond donor in the structure should be should not be more than 5 or hydrogen bond acceptor should not be more than 10. And their polar surface area should be less than 140 Armstrong. So all these are being included in the rule of 5 for uh, potent drug orientation. And they should be crossing the blood, uh, the blood barrier uh, of the from the intestine, they should reach the circulation easily. So, judging through all these uh, in silico analysis, as you can see here, uh, these are different type of models that have been generated through our uh, in silico analysis. That whether uh, these particular molecules are being able to uh, cross the uh, blood brain barrier, uh, they are actually being available towards the uh, a particular target site for a greater period of time. And as you can see in this figure, uh, this PD is having maximum oral bioavailability. So if you consume PD through this uh, uh, phenol of uh, 2411 uh, dimethyl the oral consumption of the particular molecule, uh, they are more easily available to the circulation, they are more easily bioavailable and they reside at the target for a longer period of time. So though all the three different components can be used as a potential drug in future or promoting uh, maleness or in uh, tissues or for that matter in therapeutics of any other diseases, uh, PD is actually the most potent one, which is having maximum, uh, uh, maximum sort of chance that they could be used for uh, in future. Uh, for an androgenic uh, drug itself. And uh, we have made certain publications out of throughout this uh, study. Okay, these are certain, some of our publications. And as we can understand that no study can actually be done without certain sort of funding. So some sort of funding, I think, there we are, we are grateful to the uh, funding agencies who have uh, given us the necessary amount of uh, money. And of course, uh, the work can only be performed by the research fellows or all these uh, lab mates of mine. And, uh, these are the fellow lab mates. Uh, okay, uh, some of them are actually uh, working as postdocs. Some of them are uh, being engaged in teaching in different uh, colleges, and uh, some are still working for the degrees. And uh, that is all.
Thank you. All your questions, Mary. Thank you, sir. Now, may, may we proceed to the question answer session? <laughs> 